This video started out as a basic instructional video to show you by step-by-step -step demonstration how I was able to install a free copy of Ubuntu 22.04 in the cloud. And although it still does that, it slowly morphed into a video where because I was also able to connect to the Ubuntu instance from my iPad as well as my local Windows PC, it coming with Word Excel and PowerPoint like applications. And when using my local Windows PC being able to easily map its local drives and printers, even though it's some 5,000 miles away, I could consider it as a very cheap alternative to buying a new laptop and just use my tablet instead when I was away from home. And as this solution comes completely free for the first four to five months, I would have more than enough time to play with it first and see if it met my needs before committing to getting a new laptop, if it didn't. So without further delay, let's get cracking. To keep the process easy to follow, I have split it up into six parts, each in their own chapter, so you can watch or find any part of the video that is useful to you. In the first part, I will show you how you can get the 20 euro Hetzner free trial offer that given the cheap but well-resourced server we will then build, gives you a completely free Ubuntu 22.04 instance with desktop for almost five months. In part two, I will show you how to get Putty, the popular Windows graphical user interface-based SSH client, followed by how to connect to your instance by using it. I will then show you all the commands I used to build the instance with the full Ubuntu desktop and the free No Machine Remote Control facility. I originally looked at using some form of VNC or the XRDP Linux remote control package, but found that the No Machine package offered things like allowing you to easily map a local Windows 10 drive or even a local printer. I have put all these commands in a simple build script that should be able to be used on other VPS providers also, like AWS, Google Cloud, DigitalOcean, or Linode, to name but a few, although I have only tested it on a couple of them. If you do decide to use it elsewhere, please let everyone know in the comments where works and where doesn't, so we can all benefit from what you have found. I will then show you how to install and connect to the instance's desktop using the Windows No Machine Client. They also offer clients for the Mac OS or Linux local PC, but only having access to Windows, I have not used them. I will then show you the basics of using No Machine, specifically how to map a local drive or printer. Finally, to prove how useful having this second machine can be, I will open an Excel spreadsheet that somebody sent me on my email, and I have stored on my local Windows PC disk, before printing it to my local printer that's six feet away from where I am sitting, by using only the free software that comes pre-installed on the Ubuntu desktop. For step one, I am going to show you how to get the free trial and then build the base server. So, let's do that. There is a link in the YouTube description that takes you to this special offer webpage, on which I press continue. And then the sign up button. If I was a new customer wanting to get the free credit, I would select the Register Now button. However, as an existing customer, I instead logged on with my existing user ID and password. Whatever route you take, you will end up at this main Hetzner Cloud starting web page. Now you will probably just have the first project. I have an extra one because I use Hetzner for hosting the YouTube files I need on web servers as I find them to have one of the best combinations of easy-to-use web console coupled with good value for money. Anyway, I select the first project folder and then add a new server. On the resultant specification web page, I pick the location Ashburn, Virginia as I want to host this on the east coast of America. For image, I leave Ubuntu 22.04 selected. For machine type and size, I ensure that standard and the smallest machine size is selected. As this machine comes with two gigabytes of RAM, it will be more than enough to run a full-blown desktop, the remote control software, and any application that comes pre-installed. That's on top of what the Ubuntu base server operating system needs.
When it comes to log on security, for ease of use, I just let them email me a root password. After all, I will only be using it during the server build and then locking the root account anyway, so it can be no longer used to access this server. I give the server a name I will more easily recognize, check the final price, and then press the red Create and Buy button. After a few seconds, the server is ready, and I can just select it to see all its details and all the options Hetzner provides for it. If I look in my email a minute later, there is one from Hetzner for my new instance, telling me the temporary root password they have allocated to it. And that's it. The base server is now built. For step two, I am going to download PuTTY the popular Windows SSH client, and then connect to the server instance we have just built. So let's do that. There is a link in the YouTube description that takes you straight to this official PuTTY download website. From where I use the download PuTTY link and on the resultant web page, I select the Windows 64-bit MSI installer that most versions use. After downloading and installing it, I started the main PuTTY application. For hostname or IP address, I key root then the at symbol, followed by the instance's IP address that I get from the Hetzner website. This step isn't required, but I selected the Appearance tab to choose a bigger font which shows up much better in this video. I return to the Session tab and provide a name for these settings. Finally, I hit Save, and then the Open button. As this is the first time PuTTY has connected to the instance, you will receive a confirmation window, where you will need to hit the Accept button to continue connecting. And when prompted for the password, enter the one from the Hetzner email. As this is the first time you have logged on, you will be asked to pick a new root password. You won't see me do this on the video only because I connected five minutes ago to test everything was working and I got it then. And that's it. We are now connected to the instance ready to build it, which we will do in the next chapter. For step three, I am going to run a build script. The reason I developed this simple build script was, during the making of this video, I created about 10 practice instances, on which I had to run in turn some 20 or so separate Linux command line instructions, and I kept missing an instruction or running them in the wrong order. As such, I am also making the build script available to you. As this is the first time I have logged on the existing password that's in the Hetzner email and immediately I'm asked to change it, which I do. To run the script, I copy and paste into the PuTTY window the one set of commands that you will find in the YouTube description. When run, this set of commands firstly changes to the user's home directory, installs the WGET utility if not already installed, gets a build script that simply calls each build instruction in turn, makes it executable, and then runs it. It should also work on other providers, VPS Ubuntu 22.04 instances, although it has only been fully tested on a couple of them. Please update the video comments if you are not using Hetzner, where you have successfully used it elsewhere, so we can learn from what you have found works and what doesn't. If you would rather run the 20 or so individual build instructions yourself, rather than let this build script run them for you, I will leave a copy of them all in the YouTube description so you can do so. If you are interested in seeing the script contents, copy the name of it to a web browser and hit enter to go to the script location. All the script does is tell you the Linux instruction or group of instructions it is about to run and asks you for permission to proceed, and so long as you have not typed no, it runs it, showing all output as it goes. So to start it, I simply press Enter. This first Linux instruction updates all repository indexes or pointers.
It then upgrades all packages, using the updated repository indexes to include all bug fixes and security patches. Whenever you see a screen like this, just hit the Tab key so OK is highlighted, then press Enter. I now install the main Ubuntu desktop. So, this may be a good time for a coffee break if you are at this part, as even though I have sped this bit up some 20 or 30 times, it still takes a while. So, remember if something takes a few seconds to install on the video, it will be a few minutes in real life. So, although you may think the process has hung, it hasn't. It's just taking a while to update. So, just let it finish. I now install the Stacer Resource Monitor. I have found that although the HTOP Resource Monitor is good at providing detailed monitoring when needed, however the Stacer Utility provides a good overview of the instance's resources. I then install a simple File Move Utility that is needed in a minute when fixing the operating system networking, where I first move all existing files to one side, in case I need to ever refer to them. I install the QDIR stat utility, which provides a graphical view of disk usage, just like the Windows WDIR stat program, and has allowed me to find old leftover big files several times that were using up all the disk space. I then run a series of commands that build a 2 gigabyte swap file, that although not often used, having a swap file is very useful if you accidentally open multiple applications that in aggregate are bigger than the operating system memory, to prevent the instance from hanging. I then run a series of commands that replace the default networking files with a blank one. This allows the operating system to control any networking that is otherwise completely missing from the interface and prevents you using the online drives menu as it believes there is no internet connection as the operating system doesn't control it. I then run a series of commands that firstly gets and then installs the free no machine remote control software. I then install a firewall, configure it to allow the SSH port 22 and the no machine port number 4000 through it. I now run a series of commands that creates that creates a user called no machine, includes it in several groups which among other things gives it permission to run pseudo commands prompts for its password and finally locks the root user to drastically improve security. To then ensure that all packages and settings have been started in the correct order, I reboot. For step 4, I am going to show you how to install and then connect using the No Machine Windows client. So let's do that. In a web browser, I search for No Machine and take the first link titled Free Remote Desktop for everybody to the official No Machine website. Where they have clients for Windows, Mac, and multiple families of Linux. They also have clients in the Apple App Store for iOS or the Google Play Store for Android. So whether you have an iPad, iPhone, Android tablet, or Android phone, you will also be able to connect to your Ubuntu instance from those as well, although I haven't used them yet. So from the on-screen website, I download the Windows client. After downloading, I installed it in the normal way, accepting all defaults. Among other things, it puts an icon on the desktop that I now use. 
When started for the first time, it shows a couple of information screens about this local PC before getting to the main screen. As this is the first time it's run, it searches your local network to see if there are any PCs running no machine to which it can automatically set up connection icons. There aren't, so I select Add to manually set up a connection to our Hetzner one. For address, I give the machine a name. And for host, I get the IP address of the Hetzner instance we built earlier. Just before adding the connection details, I will briefly show you the other two screens. For authentication, we are currently using the basic setting of password authentication. However, if I was trying to connect with the other three more advanced ones, it would object, saying those are only available in the paid version. There is nothing much on the Information tab, as that only gets fully populated once a connection has already been made to the instance. So I return to the Main tab and add these connection details. I then start the connection. As this is the first time, I am asked to confirm the host's certificate fingerprint, which I do. I enter the username and password I set up during the earlier build process and continue connecting. I will then be shown a series of screens that try to explain how the various connection options can be accessed. I run through them fairly quickly on the video, but in real life I would suggest you take time to read them properly. Once past them, the main Ubuntu desktop appears, and it works pretty much as if it was running on the PC in front of you. I skip through these initial screens. As a personal preference, I like to have the lock screen come up after 15 minutes of non-use, as I find the default 5 minutes too short, so I quickly make that change. And that's it. We are now connected to the instance's desktop by the No Machine client. For step 5, I am going to show you around the No Machine interface and how, for example, I map to my local drives and printers, which I will be using in the following step. I will just say at this point I have just started using No Machine, as I previously used VNC or RDP, but found both more limited, so may miss some of No Machine's features and capabilities as I have not used them yet. So, here goes. I start at the main No Machine Connections window we saw earlier and select Settings. These settings apply to all connections and not a specific one. There is the Input section that focuses on mouse and keyboard remote control options. The Appearance tab focuses on the look and feel of this No Machine interface and not the connections. The Transfers section, which I also leave untouched, provides options for limiting any file transfers these client connections can initiate. On the Security tab, you will find options if, for example, you are using a proxy server, or to limit network browsing, which I checked earlier, and now uncheck. And finally, the Folders tab where you can control where, by default, things like transferred files and screen recordings are stored. I return to the main connection screen, where as I have unchecked the network browsing option, it shows my old LAN-based test PC, where I was also playing with no machine installations.
So I start the Ubuntu 22.04 connection for the instance I built earlier, bringing up a series of screens along the way. The first is asking me to confirm this connection's user ID and password, as I previously, while logging on last time, asked that these be stored encrypted in the connections file. This screen reminds me how I can always access the connection's setting window, which I will be demonstrating in a second. And this screen shows me exactly what settings can be accessed on the main connection settings window. This screen asks me how I would like audio to be treated while using this connection. The next couple of screens show all the display resolution options that are available. Having now played around with most of them, the default one, which automatically displays the screen in any size window you choose, seems to be the best one. Finally, I connect, and the Ubuntu desktop appears. I log on. Then move the desktop window around the screen to show that a no machine window can easily be moved or resized, just like any Windows applications. Then I make the desktop window full screen, so that all further menus are easier to see on this video. There are two no machine menus available. This is the first one, which I encourage you to look through in your own time. The second is more hidden. If you move the mouse to the top left corner, the screen appears to peel, and if you click on it, it reveals the main connection settings. The input settings allow you to make the same types of keyboard and mouse changes as before, but only for this connection, not for all connections. I will run through the device's menu in a moment. The display menu lets you change how the screen appears, but now just for this connection. As I said earlier, I find the default scale to window to be the best one. The remaining four options I have not really had time to play with yet, so I will just show you each, but not describe them. Back on devices, I am able to map local disks and printers. I have not yet got USB devices to work properly and have not used the last two options, so I will ignore them for now. I will, however, leave a link in the YouTube description to the No Machine webpage explaining how these all work. For disk, I map my local Windows C drive. And just wait a second for the connection to be confirmed by a green dot. For printer, I map my local Windows HP desk jet. However, I have found that if I was to try and map the other HP LaserJet printer I have, the connection seems to terminate. This is not a big problem, as for the infrequent times I wish to print to this printer, I use the print option to save the image as a file on my Windows C drive and print it normally in Windows. Printing is notoriously finicky, so this does not surprise me. Finally, I exit all menus, back to the Ubuntu desktop. For step 6, I am going to demonstrate using the mapped local drive and printer by opening and then printing an Excel spreadsheet somebody sent me on my local PC's email. So, let's do that. Back on the Ubuntu desktop, and having previously mapped my Windows local C drive and a printer, I open File Manager. I navigate to a folder on my C drive and open an Excel spreadsheet that I have been emailed and detached. It opens in the free Ubuntu package LibreOffice Calc, which is very similar to Excel. 
There are also packages installed for a Word-like package called LibreOffice Writer and a PowerPoint-like application called LibreOffice Impress. Back on the spreadsheet, I highlight the area I want to print and define it as the print range. Then, even though this Ubuntu instance is running in a data center on the east coast of the United States, and I am in the UK, some 5,000 miles away, I print the document to my local printer, not six feet from where I am sitting. If I was ever having problems mapping a printer, I would select the Print to File option, and when prompted, save it to my local C drive, where I can print it using the normal Windows processes. However, in this case, the printer mapped successfully, so I just print to it. A few seconds later, the printed image of the spreadsheet comes off my local printer. I then return to the main Ubuntu desktop. As a bonus, I will also show you how I can, from my iPad, connect to the Ubuntu instance, using the No Machine software from the Apple App Store. They also have an Android client, but in the Google Play Store. I've only just started looking at this today, so take everything I say just as first impressions that may change over time. On the main iPad desktop, I select the No Machine application. As I have previously connected to the instance, it take me straight back to where I was. I open the LibreOffice app again, and then the LibreOffice app where I can take meeting notes or summarize one of the lectures I have to attend. So, although navigating between the tablet way of working and the home PC way of working may take some getting used to, it means that rather than have to buy a new laptop, I can just use my tablet. This will only be useful if I only need simple applications like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint-type applications, with maybe the web browser for things like my Gmail, if I was needing to run any Windows-specific software or running anything like a database, a game, or something heavy, like a video editor, I would not consider this solution, and as a final bonus, it means that I can also learn about Linux in an easy, accessible way. But as it's free for four to five months, I will play with it further to see if I can live with any limitations it brings, before I consider potentially buying a new PC. On screen, you can see the video that YouTube has selected especially for you based on your viewing history. And if you want to see more instructional videos like this one in the future, click on the CloudTech logo. Thanks for watching.